Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Chagas webinar. It's been held as part of Bioeconomy Ireland Week, um, which is the second year in a row that we have this Bioeconomy Week. And the um, Bioeconomy Week is coordinated by the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine and Biorbic. And this is one of a number of Chagas events, um, Chagas hosted events and organised events and events to which we're contributing. Um, as you may be aware, the Chagas, uh, or the Bioeconomy Policy Statement was launched by the Taoiseach's office in 2018. And since then, a lot of work has actually been done in the bioeconomy by not just researchers, but many other actors in the um, bioeconomy as well. And Chagas recently was asked to make a presentation to the Bioeconomy Implementation Group, which is co-chaired by the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Environment, Communications and Climate. And we, I think we were pleasantly surprised with the amount of work we have done to date. So I think it's just kind of useful to reflect on a number of areas of activity that we're doing at the moment, recognizing very much that um, research or researchers are only one part of the research and innovation system that's required to bring the, 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 the potential of the bioeconomy to life. So hence, we're making three presentations, uh, looking at work that has been done to date, but very much looking further um, to the impact that we're looking to achieve um, subsequently. So we have three presentations. The first is by Dr. Ewan Mullins from the Crop Environment and Land Use Programme. He will talk about expanding the alternative use and circularity potential of crops. The second presentation is pro from Professor Brijesh Tiwari from the Food Programme. He's talking about the contribution of marine bioresources to the bio-based economy. And our third presentation is a presentation by Anya Mackin Walsh uh, with inputs from Kieran Harahill from the Rural Economy Programme, which is about an actor-oriented approach to understanding and co-creating Ireland's bioeconomy society interface. And we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers. And um, so we, we obviously, we don't have a ch the chat function enabled because this is a webinar, but we very much welcome your questions that you can input through the, the Q&A um, tab at the bottom. So I'll hand over to, to Ewan Mullen for the first presentation of the morning. Thank you, Ewan. Thank you, Maeve, and good morning, everybody. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so so I suppose just to kick it off, we're coming at this from, from the crop side of, of things. And uh, as I look out the window here above me, it's absolutely lashing here in Kildare at the moment. And I suppose the, the, the weather map on the left-hand side is something that we've become quite familiar with in, in, uh, in our time, obviously, here in Ireland. So, but basically, it's that weather, it's that actual climate that uh, drives the, the high yield potential we have for our crops. And Ireland is indeed a, a, a great place for producing crops and plant biomass. Um, the warm, uh, relatively damp climate uh, is, is perfect in terms of establishment and then maximizing yields. So in terms of the crops that we primarily produce, in the table on the bottom of the slide there, you'll see our, our main ones are the cereals, winter wheat, barley, spring barley, um, oats, and then also beans, potatoes, and, and oil seed rape. And those crops dominate our, our, our tillage land, which is uh, on average somewhere around 300,000 hectares per year. And the outputs from that sector are critical for both the, the livestock sector as an animal feed, but also as raw ingredients for food. And in recent years, the, the market in, in malting and distilling has expanded dramatically and the tillage sector provides important key ingredients for that in the terms of uh, barley for malting. As I said, the land has stabilized in recent years, but there are significant challenges remaining um, and more to come into the future. Land competition is, is an issue because it's driving high rental costs. And then one of the biggest challenges for the tillage sector is that the, the costs that uh, are the, the margins and the economic returns that farmers receive are benchmarked on international prices. And the challenge there is that, of course, the efficiencies in terms of land use, machinery, and indeed genetics um, between Ireland and, and the EU versus international markets, they can be quite disparate. So as a result, um, uh, it can be sometimes a, a, an uneven playing field for, for Irish producers. On top of that, obviously, high input costs are, are, are a constant problem. And in recent months, obviously, fertilizer costs have, have reached the headlines. And that's a, a clear example of where when input costs can rise dramatically, quite quickly, 
it can very, uh, very quickly erode the margins available to farmers. Within Europe, obviously, there is the drive for increased environmental sustainability in our food production systems. And the European Green Deal is, is the strategic benchmark for that policy out to 2030. Within that, then, we have farm to fork. And the goals of farm to fork are to reduce inputs, be they uh, chemical pesticides, fungicides, and also fertilizer uses as well. So to give you an idea, actually, of, of why we, we use uh, chemical inputs in our crop production systems. The next slide is, is a panel of images of diseases that farmers would be very familiar with. But if you're not growing crops, you, you might never have heard of these diseases and you certainly wouldn't be aware of their impact. So from the left hand side, we've got fusarium and wheat, which is an important disease of the head of the, the wheat plant. Let me just put on my pointer here. Um, and it manifests in this um, yellow orange staining within the, the grains. It's a, a very important pathogen because it produces mycotoxins and they can have um, health, health impacts both for in animal feed and indeed in humans. So it's very important to control diseases such as fusarium. And then into barley, we have ramularia, which is this um, scatter or uh, um, splattering of, of the leaf with spores. And you get this dark speckling. Here is rhynchosporium. And then over to the right, we have septoria in wheat. For all of the, the three diseases from right to left, the, the challenge here is that they effectively destroy the leaf tissue. And when you destroy the leaf tissue, you destroy the photosynthetic capacity of the plant to produce sugars. And those sh sugars go up into the, the, the grains and are stored as starch. So if you can't protect the leaf tissue from these diseases, which occur every year, um, you're going to have reduced yield and hence the margins become un unproductive and unsustainable. So diseases, while we have fantastic plant growth, we also have a fantastic climate for diseases and these chemicals are needed for, for the, the, the management of the crops at the moment. But out to 2030, things are going to have to change. And I suppose the response to that is that we have to start to uh, integrate more uh, pest management uh, measures which are called IPM, Integrated Pest Management Platforms. And the core part of that is stronger genetics, uh, delivering stress-resilient varieties. And the challenge there is that it just takes too much time. Um, an average potato variety, you're looking at 12 to 13 years, a cereal variety, on average, about 10 years. So the varieties that are started now in terms of the initial crossings now in glass houses, they're the varieties for 2030 and 2031. So that gives you some context as to the, the challenges we have. And for our end in Chagas, we're putting a lot of resources and time into field evaluations. So be that uh, phenotyping and screening novel material coming through breeding programs with European breeders. And we're looking for stress resilience in the absence of chemical management systems. So basically a worst case scenario. And can these new varieties, can this material stand up against Irish diseases? Alternatively, you can breed and I suppose a bit of a game changer in terms of, of breeding plants as what's been called speed breeding in the last couple of years. And we've invested heavily in facilities in Oak Park. And what it does is it's a different lighting system. Um, and as you can see on the right hand side, you've got the LED lights and they give a broader spectrum that optimizes that, that, that photosynthetic rate within plants. And it's very clear from the, the bottom right where we have uh, wheat plants grown, uh, all the four pots were sown at the same date and on the left hand side without the LEDs and on the right hand side with the LEDs. And that's taken after uh, three to four weeks. And similarly, over here, we have potato. So the benefit of this is that you can deliver up to four cycles of breeding in one year uh, and effectively doubling the, the, the gain and the potential of the breeding program. And that is very important. But all of that aside, what that's going to do is that's going to uh, hopefully allow the sector to, to meet the challenges that are obviously very much on the cards out to 2030 with farm to fork, breeding more resilient varieties. But we need more than that. And really what we have to do is we have to underpin that sustainability of producers, the economic sustainability. And to do that, we have to develop new added value opportunities for farmers. So the environmental sustainability of the sector has been well flagged, approximately 1 to 1.1 uh, uh, tons of CO2 equivalent per hectare. Um, so in terms of its sustainability, its greenhouse gas emissions are low relative to, for example, dairy or, or beef production. But by integrating disciplines 
we can support the development of such premium markets and effectively get more from what is already being produced. So at the moment, we know we can produce lots of material, but can we get added value from it? And that really is, is the key bit. And obviously valorizing waste streams. So to give you uh, just some, some very brief examples of some of the work that's ongoing at the moment, um, one of our crops that we grow was faba bean here in, in the bottom right, but also we would have a very good capacity to grow lupins. And obviously previously we would have grown a lot of peas. So developing alternative proteins for the Irish systems is, is a key target for our, our research. And we're very fortunate to be involved in a project called U-Protein, uh, led by Mark Fenlon down in, in Moorpark and with uh, multiple collaborators across the institutions in UCC, Galway, uh, Minute, Limerick and Queens and all over Chagas. And it's a very exciting project uh, at multiple levels. But from our perspective in, in crops, the, the U-protein is most exciting because it exposes us to the other disciplines uh, of research that can, can, can give us hope in that what farmers are producing can be processed, uh, can be formulated and into novel food and feed products. So the title of the project U Protein is on the left. It's basically about unlocking that potential from material. So for us, we're focusing on, as I said, uh, protein crops such as beans and lupins and peas. And the idea is that the material we produce is then brought on to the next stage for in terms of uh, processing, looking at new biorefining and biotransformation processes and ultimately doing protein profiling so can we tailor the agronomy of our, our cropping systems so that we can enhance the outputs that are down here in terms of the protein profiling? profiling? Um, and in addition, within new protein, there's, out, there's sensory uh, and food, food investigations as well. The goal here is to develop novel foods, novel processes, be that in for prepared consumer foods, dairy platform or meat platform, but absolutely essential. And you can see around the outside, is that the, the carbon footprint, the life cycle analysis is completed in depth. So rather than just developing new systems that may have an economic potential, we need to be able to rubber stamp them and show that there is strong environmental sustainability in these systems as well. So by tailoring the amino acid profiles of, of protein crops, what exactly does that mean? So to give an example, um, farmers at the moment get a premium for producing barley for malting, and that's due to the, the care they take in terms of the management of the crop, in terms of tailoring the fertilizer inputs and making sure that the protein levels meet a certain benchmark. And similarly, for example, for, for gluten-free oats, there are certain management scenarios that farmers have to adopt. It takes more work and hence there's a, a greater premium for it. So what we're looking at is, is can we tailor, as I said, the agronomy, can we tailor the fertilizer inputs, the management of the crops, the varieties of the crops, um, so that they will deliver a greater potential for that post-harvest processing that processors may need and ultimately deliver a premium back to the, back to the producer. However, we have to deal with, with constant agronomic challenges in the field. So I mentioned pea there a few minutes ago. Uh, pea is a great crop, uh, grows very well in Ireland, uh, and these images taken from work from Sheila Alves in, in Oak Park uh, clearly show one of the problems we have with pea. When it was sown in April, we get a, a great crop in May standing up really tall. But what tends to happen is that as you get near harvest time, the, there's a great propensity for the crop to lodge. And it's completely flat on the ground in the plots here. This is just pea only. The problem here, of course, is that once it's flat on the ground, it's extremely difficult to harvest and effectively becomes a feed source for, for birds, um, which is great for the birds, but not, not the farmers obviously uh, aren't going to be too happy about it. But there's actually what we think is a very simple fix, and it's called intercropping. And Sheila has shown the last two years at work at Oak Park, a really nice way of keeping the peas standing up is intercropping them with faba beans. And here in this picture here, at the same date, we have a mixed crop of faba and, 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 and peas, and here the pea crop is standing up because effectively the fab of bean access is scaffold uh, for the pea, pea um, uh, strands and lentils to wrap themselves around and support the pea crop. So the benefits of this, what is what might seem as a very simple measure is actually very significant because now what we have is the potential to produce two sources of protein coming from the same field um, faba bean, which is used to uh, as a, a direct livestock feed, 
but also the farmer has potential to produce pea, a pea crop. And pea as a, as a protein, a high protein crop, has great potential as both as a flour for confectionery, uh, confectionery products and baking, but in a range of other different food products as well. So the, this work is indeed very exciting. Another project that we have ongoing, actually one of the, we have a meeting uh, starting today with the new PhD student after this webinar. Uh, the project is called EXPECT. It's linked closely with Uprotein and it's primarily a desktop study led by Suzanne Bart and Maeve uh, Henshin and Fiona Thorne in Chagas with colleagues in UCC and MTU. And the idea is listed here is, is to look at the economic assessment and the technical assessments of using grass and cover crops as a valuable compound for the, that, that circular bioeconomy. So can we get more from what we grow? Farmers are going to be, are, are being um, uh, encouraged strongly to grow cover crops, to catch fertilizer runoff um, as part of uh, mitigation measures. That's a very important uh, aspect of future management, but can we get more from that practice? And that's one of the goals of this project. Also to look at experimental trials for the production of volatile fatty acids and indeed biogas as well. So malting and distilling is obviously, uh, uh, malting especially is key for the drinks industry in Ireland. Um, for tillage production in Ireland, we produce uh, about 2.3 million tonnes of grain uh, every year and about 300,000 tonnes of that goes to the malting industry. One of the challenges we have is that we only produce basic malt in Ireland um, and the drinks uh, industry requires a more, if they need a more specialised malt, that has to be imported or they export the grain and then re-import the, the malt. And that, in effect, is diluting the, the origin, the provenance of the material. So with funding from the Department of uh, Agriculture, we've been able to establish a new malting innovation hub in Oak Park with the ability to malt down as far as 250 grams up to a quarter of a ton. It's been recently commissioned. And the real potential here is that we can start to use the processes coming out of U protein to exploit the, the spent grain, which is a waste material from the malting process, typically used as an animal feed, but can we get more value from it as well? So another, another exciting initiative. And finally, to conclude, basically, we're, we're very good at growing potatoes, but can we expand potato production in Ireland? Um, we produce there about 400,000 tonnes of potato every year. The retail value is listed. But people would be very surprised to know that we import about 70 to 80,000 tonnes of potatoes every year. Um, which is, is surprising, to say the least, because we, we, we have a fantastic, uh, fantastic potato sector with highly efficient growers uh, and equipment to produce what, what we need. So there is a, a very strong opportunity for import substitution here, be that in salad potatoes and fresh chipping potatoes and indeed potato seed. We've seen with Brexit the challenges that that, that presents for us in terms of, of importing potato seed. So there are great opportunities here in terms of the economy supporting the rural networks uh, and the potato sector, while uh, small in size, uh, is certainly not small in its economic input. So to conclude, um, our climate, as I said, supports excellent plant growth. We, we record some of the highest cereal yields in the world each year, up in wheat, about 10 to 11 tonnes per hectare. And there is now, I suppose, a more increased awareness of what plants can deliver. It's not just a matter of growing plants, um, harvesting and then moving them into uh, direct feed, animal feed systems. We can get more from what we produce and that diversity of outcomes be it through pre-harvest management or post-harvest processing can deliver that potential. However, the key thing here is that the economic returns for producers have to be tangible. Um, it's not going to work if, if they're not. And I suppose there is, there is sometimes a, a reluctance on the consumer's behalf to, to pay the added premium and yet the benchmarks of, of increased sustainability, all the traceability are all needed. So there, there does need to be, I suppose, a, a process engagement to, to highlight the challenges facing farmers. Sorry, you and I just have to ask you to wrap up. Yes, yeah, sorry, please. Perfect, mate. Thank you. So, so basically, the plant-based protein is really the, the, the primary focus for us. Um, looking ahead, U protein and other projects at a European level are the ones where we'll be putting the majority of, of our efforts into at the moment so that we can grow that protein both for both feed and for food purposes. So thank you, Maeve. Um, I just want to thank the people on, listed here on the slide for their help in the last few days in, in sending me material. I'm very happy to take any questions that are there. Thank you very much, Ewan. And we'll keep our questions for the end. So I'd just like to hand over to Brigitte Tawari now 
uh, Brigitte is going to talk to us. He's going to move from the crops to the, to the marine side. So over to you, Brigitte. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Maeve. Uh, <clears throat> very good morning. Uh, I'm going to cover about the contribution of marine bioresources to the bio-based economy. And first of all, uh, what we really means marine bioresources and what it, how it is relevant for our own uh, bio-based economy is, uh, as per OECD definition, we think marine organisms as a source of factory of useful and needful product and solution for societal challenges. So marine bioresources not only includes uh, seafoods, but it also includes a range of different microorganisms, plants, including seaweeds and macroalgae. If you look into the landscape, like we have a very long coastline and we have huge amount of, uh, of area under the sea, which can be really exploited. One of the flagship document related to <clears throat> To make an integrated marine plan, um, marine plan for Ireland was harnessing our ocean wealth, which mainly focused on thriving maritime economy, sets out the goal to achieve healthy ecosystems, aim to increase our engagement with the sea. This was the first document of 2012. Uh, 2012. After that, we had a series of documentation, series of um, strategy document, and we have achieved a lot when it comes to marine bio resources. Some of the key research programs, what I'm going to give a snapshot of some of the research that has been carried out in Chagas with in collaboration with the European partners, as well as with, uh, with national partners, include Neutromara, that's Marine Functional Food Research Initiative, currently ongoing Bioeconomy Research Center, that's Marine Spokes, Bacteria Carbohydrates for Food, that was SUSFOOD 2 call, which is just finished and ongoing project on all sustainable aquaculture technologies that's uh, still ongoing. So, so if you look into marine bioresources, it's very difficult to focus almost on all the marine bioresources or all the research work which is carried out in this space. However, I'd like to focus mainly on seaweeds or microalgae. On, on the right side, you see how the microalgae can be sustainably can be, can be grown in our sea. And one of the greatest advantage of these macroalgae plants is these are fastest growing plants and they're able to contribute up to 50 to 71 percent of world carbon fixation. That means carbon sequestration is uh, potential accounts for almost 36 to 500 tons CO2 per hectare per annum. So that's uh, a huge figure and considering this huge variation is mainly depending upon different CBD species which can be grown in Ireland not only in Ireland, as well as in European waters. Now, the most important question what we have, how do we sustainably exploit these resources? The two approaches, if you know our uh, bioeconomy, <clears throat> bioeconomy map, one is to reduce the dependencies on fossil-based economy, and marine plays a vital role to move ourselves from fossil-based economy to bioeconomy. And second one is to transform, that means by unlocking the potential of seas and ocean in terms of macroalgae and other marine bioresources, how best we can make a circular economy. And this can be really achieved. If you take the figure, whatever aquaculture is achieved, which is grown, obviously it's uh, carbon negative, that means it's act as a carbon, um, carbon sink. Employing state-of-the-art conversion systems to transform these by this biomass into a range of different products by using different technologies and looking into the application of these. And marine bioresources, mainly aquaculture seaweed or wild harvested seaweed, can provide us a range of different benefits, including feed. A lot of research studies have been carried out which demonstrate when seaweeds are used as a cattle feed. They can reduce methane emission, can reduce dependencies on uh, on soya as a protein. Obviously, we get a range of different food products, various pharmaceutical, cosmeceuticals, and various additives. And the rest of the biomass can easily be used for biogas. So all these greenhouse gases, which can be emitted during the conversion of uh, raw biomass into value-added product, can act as CO2 sink. In a nutshell, the whole process can be uh, either carbon negative or carbon neutral. If you look into the seaweed biomass itself, 
So various aspects are there and we can add value to the product, ranging from uh, getting value added product that's pharmaceutical chemicals, nutraceuticals, cosmetics, food and feed, fertilizers as well as energy. So we can add value and this is possible by applying cascading approach. To achieve this, we have either to biotransform, that is transform the value added products, to, uh, to transform raw biomass into value added product for range of different application, or add value to existing usage of seaweeds. For instance, in primarily in Europe, now seaweed is seen as a superfood. Previously, uh, seaweeds were used mainly for production of uh, mainly hydrocolloids, which, is have, which are obviously used for range of different applications. And looking at the marine bioresources, they directly addresses six different United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. That's good health and well-being, clean water and sanitation, industry innovation and infrastructure, responsible consumption and production, climate action, and life below sea. As you can see, life below sea, just uh, as a video background uh, on Zoom, so if you look into whole of the chain of our biotransformation, ISC weeds, first most important aspect over here is the primary processing. The key challenge is what we are addressing at, in Chagas in collaboration with other industrial partners as well as uh, primary producer is what is the best way of growing seaweeds? That's the uh, aquaculture uh, production and how best to do the primary processing. That means not the harvesting side, but how do we convert the raw biomass, which is around 70% moisture, how that raw biomass directly can be converted into value-added product, A. B is how they can be dried, because drying is one of the most intensive process, and there are a lot of technological advances being made, which can allow preservation of uh, macroalgae on site, A. B, they can help in drying in a faster rate, which reduces less amount of energy, uh, less amount of energy. Second comes secondary processing. That means converting those uh, dried seaweed or uh, fresh biomass into different products, which can subsequently be used for targeted processing, that's tertiary processing. And by using a biorefinery approach, we are in a position to produce sustainable diets nutritious and sustainable diets, climate smart, environment sustainable food systems, circular resource efficient food systems, innovation and empowering empowerment of our communities. That means especially the coastal economies. So this particular flow diagram clearly demonstrates how seaweeds can be, or macro algae is one of the key marine bioresource can be used for a range of different applications. Now, going back to bio-based economy, and as you can see over here, aquaculture seaweed, we work with the research institutes in Ireland and, and in European uh, institutions, along with the in industry to convert all these resources into multi-stock uh, biorefineries. And I have some of those bio uh, some of those value chains which we have uh, we have established, and we're currently working closely as a part of various uh, research programs. For instance, one of the value chain more, oh, sorry. One of the value chain relates to food and a feed. Direct food application of seaweed goes as a soup mix, bakery products, and snacks. We have been working with uh, with the industry to make direct product application, which not only provides uh, good source of nutrients, bioactives, as well as uh, good uh, act as a good protein source, or to use various fractions of, uh, of macroalgae to obtain proteins, alginates, and dietary fiber. And whatever residues are obtained in this particular process can be used for biogas. Obtaining alginates or, or uh, alginates or any other sources of agar or any other hydrocolloid is not new. It's been known for last uh, 400 years. However, traditional processes involve the usage of a lot of chemicals, which are not considered as green. Because of that, we cannot utilize other fractions of uh, macroalgae. One of our key research agenda here is to uh, employ clean and green extraction systems, 
That means we green the current processes so that we can utilize every fraction of it and it makes easier way to get a cleaner ingredient. Contrary to that, seaweeds we investigated already for usage for cattle feed for feed formulation, not, a, not only as an alternative to protein, but also direct consumption of feed for reducing methane emission from the wine. Seaweeds for fish feed as a part of Aquatech for feed project. Second one, insects for using in uh, for using seaweeds for insect feed, and which in turn can be used for chicken feed in formulation with seaweeds. So this is the smaller circles within a larger circular economy. And now going to the further value addition to these fractions, it's again. If you go with the molecular level to fractionate the compound based on the molecular weights, we have a range of different pharmaceutical and nutraceutical compounds such as fecoidin, laminarin, amino acids, and so the low molecular weight fractions can be obtained for fermentable sugars, which can be converted into high value chemical, for instance, succinic acid, butyndiol, mannitol, which can be converted and to be used as a mallitol as a sugar replacer, which is uh, which is a natural sweetener, which is at least uh, 20 to 30 times less sweeter than sucrose, and biostimulant, which act as a fertilizer. So the, the word mentioned here, hydrodynamic cavitation, is one of the technological approaches. I'm not going into detail of any of the technological approaches, what has been uh, employed at Chagas, obviously in collaboration with the other research partner. However, there are a range of different technologies which can be used for fractionation of different compounds for value-added chains. And as you can clearly see here, we have identified four key value chains related to feed, food, biochemicals, nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, and cosmeceuticals. So there are a lot of value chains can be obtained. And this is all is a rosy, a rosy picture which we can obviously obtain, but we do have key challenges and significant amount of opportunities. This includes, how do we do sustainable production of macroalgae? Because current contribution of Irish or European aquaculture is only less than 1% compared to other Asian countries. How best we can establish uh, carbon sequestering potential of native macroalgal species, which are grown in Ireland, how can we maximize the potential of algae as an industrial feedstock? Still, we have one of the key challenges to obtain the key environmental benefits and risk of aquaculture production and develop bio-based value chain and improve the TRL level for industry to take these, uh, <laughs> these challenges. And by doing so, we can increase Irish dominance in a market of marine-based product, which is currently captured by Asian countries in terms of alginates and alginates, agar, pecoidin, and various other nutraceuticals. So to draw conclusions, sustainable exploitation is challenging, though achievable. Both translational and transformational approach will be required for carbon negative or neutral bio-based value chains. When I, when I say translation approach, that means research has already been established based on various research programs. Now we need innovative approaches to convert that research into value-added products. There are numerous technologies, as I mentioned, but they do require innovative <clears throat> translation for zero-waste approach. That means when we use marine bio or marine bio resources, we do in such a way that we do not leave uh, any waste. And the various value chain what I've shown in previous slides clearly demonstrate this is possible. And, and this is possible only by adoption circular economy or biorefinery with, to obtain key tangible benefits. So <clears throat> I wish to acknowledge all our uh, current and past researchers who have been involved in the marine research program, which is obviously being uh, funded generously by European Commission Science Foundation, Ireland Department of Agriculture, Chagas and Marine Institute. And, this is only a fraction of the research which has been carried out in marine bioresources. I haven't de dealt with duckweed. I haven't dealt with any of those seafoods and various byproducts which are produced by seafood and which can be used for a range of different applications. With this, I conclude my talk.
Thank you very much, Brigitte. I think we've covered a lot of issues and, and principles of, of the bioeconomy there. So thank you very much for that. So uh, we'll go on to our final speaker, uh, Dr. Anya McEnwalsh, with inputs from Kieran Harrell um, and, and an actor-oriented approach to understanding and co-creating Ireland's bioeconomy interface. Over to you, Anya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maeve, and it's a pleasure to be part of this webinar this morning. So as Maeve uh, has stated, the title of this presentation and the focus of this presentation is taking an actor-oriented perspective uh, to understanding Ireland's um, developing, evolving bioeconomy. And what that means essentially is that we look at the evolution and current experiences of involvement or non-involvement in Ireland's current uh, bioeconomy through the lens of different actors involved or prospective actors who could be in, involved in Ireland's bioeconomy. And in our research, uh, which involves Kieran Harahill, who's with us this morning, who's working full time as a PhD Walsh scholar on the project, together with colleagues Owen and Michael Lennon in uh, UCD, we are focusing uh, explicitly on the farming population. And I'll speak a little bit about why we are doing that a, a few minutes into the presentation. So the first uh, just quotation here that will set the scene for the, the challenge of this particular research is that the bioeconomy is understood as a site of struggle. So as we are social scientists, we understand the bioeconomy, particularly as a nascent economy in the Irish context, as an economy that has no one defined singular meaning. Um, rather, it is interpreted, understood, and viewed through the lenses of different actors, different types of people. We, we call them actors in, in social science. So depending on whether one is involved in industry, research, agriculture, the marine, we all will have a different understanding of what the bioeconomy is and what it offers to us. And just to speak a little bit now about what uh, the lens or the prism through which people view the bioeconomy and how they value the bioeconomy. So whether or which they are motivated to become involved in the bioeconomy, they see it as something that is valuable, um, depends on humans' values. So sociological research would, uh, this is a very simple interpretation, but um, while some fields of study may perceive or view or focus uh, ex explicitly or specifically on the economic drivers that motivate human behavior or decisions to become involved in a particular form of economic activity, um, specifically because of, for instance, motivated by money. We also look at the social aspects that motivate and drive people to become involved or not involved. So which is their relationships with others, their peer relationships, and also this pride. And what that means is the types of esteem um, that people associate with particular types of activities, the activities that they feel pride in. So that's a very important um, aspect that does motivate behavior and decisions to become involved or not involved in particular types of economic activity. Our theoretical framework is informed by the famous Michel Foucault, the Parisian uh, philosopher, sociologist, and we understand that particularly as an economy is newly developed in any particular context, um, at, which is the case with Ireland's bioeconomy, it's still very much evolving, some would say nascent. There is a process where information is processed socially and where certain information can be labeled as a fact or truth or otherwise, while other information can be discredited or excluded. And this happens in social processes, through conversations with others, through exposure to new forms of information, and crucially, how that information is communicated or disseminated to society can have crucial impacts later on, on how um, certain types of information are accepted by people and how other types of information and when I mean, when I say information, it's not just factual or scientific information. It's information in relation to potential of particular types of industry and so on, how some ideas are excluded or discredited and how others are what we might say reified or accepted as truth. 
it's very important in early stages and in the various stages um, of evolution where new forms of economic activity are concerned is that a particular regime of truth is established all along the way, a particular type of narrative. And it's very important to us to understand what the evolving narrative underpinning involvement or non-involvement in the bioeconomy is. And we might also seek to influence that and to ensure that it is evolving in a way that is acceptable to as wide a variety of people as possible and particularly considering farmers, the agricultural population. So people have different perspectives and we, we attune into that and we study that and research that. So the rationale for a focus on agriculture. We know from international experience in particular that there have been deficiencies in how the bioeconomy is developed. And we just think back to what I just mentioned there. I know it was quite theoretical, but it is to explain what we are focusing on from a social science perspective. So how is the narrative evolving? What's the language of Ireland's bioeconomy? How acceptable is it to different types of actors in uh, the ACUS, which we call the Agriculture Knowledge and Innovation System, to the population of people who could, who could potentially become involved? Is it sufficiently acceptable to that diversity uh, um, of people? So we know from international evidence that the narrative hasn't been as inclusive or as acceptable as it might, uh, as it could be. So in how bioeconomy policy is developed, we see that there really has been creating acceptance for priorities that have already been formed or set, rather than involving people in shaping the language, the policies that support the bioeconomy. It's also uh, noted internationally that important segments of society, you know, segments on, on whom the bioeconomy depends in order to reach its full potential, that they do not see the bioeconomy as a possible or desirable future. So they don't see the bioeconomy as for them. And also, this is another perspective, which we, we have from our own uh, Irish researchers, Maeve Henshin and Laura Devaney, the bioecology vision, as an alternative to the two statements above there, sees producers as managers of ecosystems rather than mere commodity producers. So a really inclusive approach to developing Ireland's bioeconomy would see the input suppliers or the primary producers as participants in shaping the agenda of the bioeconomy. So we have three elements to the study and I am going, they're interlinked and I'm just going to very briefly overview them. Our first approach is social network analysis. And this is where we chart and we identify what is the nature of Ireland's bioeconomy social network currently? So in other words, who is involved, who is not involved, and who are the very important intermediaries within the network that connect others together? There are existing international examples internationally where all the various actors are identified and the relationships charted between them and we can see here from the size of the circles, the nodes, as we call them, the significance of the actors, uh, of the actor types in the bioeconomy. Here's another model uh, from Germany, um, another one from Brazil. And we have here uh, the Irish bioeconomy, which Kevin Harahill developed through desk based research. And he has identified here all of the actors who were involved in the bioeconomy, in the Irish bioeconomy. And this is very, a very recent diagram, so it's up to date. And the sectors are color coded there um, and the relationships between them and so on. Very important about this diagram though and about the value of social network analysis is we can identify actors who aren't involved in the social network currently. And that provides us with an evidence base for targeting cohorts of the population um, who we would like to see involved in creating the narrative of Ireland's developing bioeconomy. This is another um, excellent diagram produced by Kieran. And on the outer ring there, we can see some of the dominant players in Ireland's bioeconomy and the relationships they have with other actors in the inner ring there. The second part of the study is when we focus specifically on the narrative. So first we chart the network, we identify those who are prominently involved and those who are absent or marginalized. And then we examine particular narratives. And we use a, a particular interviewing method, which is the biographic narrative interpretive method. And we 
took a focus, and those interviews are almost complete, on Irish primary producers who are involved in the bioeconomy, bioeconomy and they're actually, they are dairy farmers. And then we look at a cohort in the agricultural population who are not involved, and they are uh, dry stock farmers. So they have been studied separately, and papers are being written up currently about their particular understandings of the bioeconomy, um, how, they, how the dairy farmers did become involved, which will, may provide some inspiration for involving other cohorts. And then also very important, the, the narratives of dry stock farmers. And there is a limited engagement there. We know from the evidence from the social network analysis that dry stock farmers do not have a prominent role. So it's very important for us to understand their narratives, how, see, how they see themselves possibly becoming involved, and also some of the barriers that, that, that they identify and knowledge gaps and so on. And when I mean knowledge gaps, it's, I don't refer to lack of knowledge, but rather how their knowledge may not align with the current language of the bioeconomy. And it's only when we have that type of ed evidence can we develop strategies to address gaps, barriers and so on. So this is the going back to the values, the social, cultural, economic um, that drive people, and we, we are attentive to those values in the narratives and, uh, of the beef farmers, the dry stock farmers. And then we look at the different types of truth regimes, going back to our theoretical framework there. And it's only when we take all of that into account can we, I, can we really understand how um, Ireland's bioeconomy is currently developing, but also how may, we may assist to shape the narrative so that it becomes more inclusive. The final aspect of the study is co-design. When armed with this knowledge of the social network, the existing social network, the gaps within it, and understanding the narratives of actors who could be more involved uh, in the bioeconomy and, in, and shaping the, the narrative or the truth regime, as the sociologists would call it, we engage in a process called co-design. And that's when we involve um, dry stock farmers, other farmers, in identifying projects entry routes to the bioeconomy that they see as feasible. So we know that, just to go into a little bit about the approach of co-design, we know that the traditional model of tech transfer, just producing technologies and expecting uh, actors to take them up, or models of industrial uh, activity and expecting actors just to take them up, that this doesn't work. And here on the right here, we see where we, for in a process of co-innovation, uh, we involve the end users in actually designing these models themselves. So this is just a graphic showing how all the various different types of knowledges are involved. And we use co-design methods to facilitate multi-actor wor workshops to actually vision real life models that can be practically implemented by uh, members of the agricultural population. And this is to operationalize and to activate new components, new entry routes, new types of activities for Ireland's bioeconomy with primary producers as key actors, as primary actors. We're, we are working and funded by SFI Biorbic and this activity, this research activity is committed to the ambition of Biorbic to engage, inspire and to involve the public with our research. And there's a very strong education and public engagement aspect of Biorbic that is uh, very active and is, is, you will see many activities associated with that element of Biorbic uh, in this week, uh, National Bioeconomy Week. So we combine the narrative analysis, understanding their values and the co-design to develop uh, models for activation in real life practice. And this is not something in fact that has been done in international research and practice to date to our knowledge although there have been excellent studies, as I, as I showed um, on the social network analysis and gaps have been identified, this type of action research process has not been completed heretofore. We are cooperating with the Liaison Horizon 2020 project for this multi-actor co-design process um, that is, we have attached to this study uh, for Biorbic. We are using a toolbox that Chagas has developed for implementation in many Horizon 2020 uh, multi-actor projects. And this is just a concrete example from the Cherry Ray Horizon 2020 project, where we crafted a, an ideal social network 
for the development of heritage serials in the Irish context. And we initiated a social network in real life involving all the various actors and supporting collaborations between them. Some papers here produced by uh, Kieran Harahill, the, the Walsh Scholar working full time on the project. And if you'd like to hear more from Kieran, there will be a link in the presentation to his interview on ABC Breakfast Weekend. And thank you very much. I think you, I just, you were just about to interrupt me, Maeve. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Anya. And thank you very much to all our speakers for, for keeping very much to time. Um, I heard a quote during the week and it said, um, if you think you can do it by yourself, you're not thinking big enough. And I think um, each of our presentations today have highlighted really the need for collaboration and working together um, across disciplines and with many actors to, to realise the potential of the bioeconomy. And Anya's work in particular has showed us the issues that we need to think about and the practical uh, ways we can go about that. So we have a few minutes for questions and answers. Um, and we have some very specific questions and some more detailed questions. So keep, please keep those questions going. Um, the first question is a very specific question for Ewan. Um, it's asking how the, the peas and the beans can be separated. Uh, Ewan gave us a very nice, a very kind of simple solution to, to lodging um, in faba beans. So if you could just ex give us this response to that, Ewan, please. Yeah, no, it's it's a very practical question and it makes perfect sense. So the we've been told by processors that, that it should be straightforward in terms of just using physical sieving. And that's really down to the differential size and shape of a pea grain versus a faba bean grain. So it's, it's actually quite a simple solution. Um, and it, it's one of those things that then opens up more opportunities and more, more for the producer because they have the option to harvest it as a complete crop, send that mixed lot to the processor where, where they would uh, separate it. Or indeed, there's the potential for on-farm processing um, where the farmer could do the separation themselves send the pea off for, for processing or indeed the faba bean into a different route and a different value chain, or indeed use the, the, the faba bean themselves for their own livestock or for the neighboring livestock. So again, you're getting that, you're, you're just diversifying the potential from, from one cropping system. That integrated and cascading thinking, I think is really useful there as well. And you, just while you're there, there's another very specific question as well about um, allergies. Um, with the increase in food allergies, is there a concern about the allergenicity of alternative food crops, particularly of legumes and lupins? Okay, so um, obviously with, with diets shifting away from, I suppose, the more traditional uh, gluten cereal-based diets, I think there is, um, I suppose, recognition within literature that there are probably people are becoming more aware of, of maybe allergies to certain things. Um, I'm not an expert in that area. But obviously, as, as, as products are formulated and processed and, and developed, there would obviously have to be a, a food health uh, uh, analysis done on, on anything that, that, that's produced. I mean, uh, pea and faba bean and, and lupin are all available in, in, in shops and, and supermarkets at the moment in various different forms. But uh, it's a very valid question. And I suppose it's something that, that agencies, state agencies and researchers would have to look at. Great, thank you very much, you. And so I'll move on to Brigesh now a little bit. Brigesh talked to us about some of the challenges and opportunities um, that will be arising in, in his work. And Brigesh, can you talk to us about uh, who you're working with at the moment or who you might need to work with in the future to, to bring your uh, research into, into, into practice more? Yeah, uh, maybe at the moment, as far as industry is concerned, we are working with a range of different uh, industries which are involved in, uh, at various, for various value chains, including food. Uh, not at the moment with the feed, but uh, we have some ongoing uh, proposals in consideration for EU with some of the feed companies. We are also working with aquaculture producers based in Bentry as well as in uh, in Kerry at the same and uh, County Mayo. That's uh, Dudra Marine. So some of those images are obviously from those aquaculture. And one of the key challenges at the moment is associated with how do we move forward and just make products which are much more economical for industry to work. And one of the one of the flagship projects of SFI Biobake Research Center, we're working closely with the industry. And uh, I think uh, at the moment, we wish to increase our engagement more with uh, also with the end users eh? and uh, as well as with some of those legislators to see that how best we can uh, address those uh, regulatory hurdles related to different ingredients, how best it can be approved by European, uh, um, European Commission. 
Thank you, Patricia. And I suppose reflecting on Anya's um, work as well, just talking about relationships, I think our need to develop relationships outside of the, the traditional sectors um, is going to be a challenge for us in, in terms of uh, bringing forward that work as well. So Anya, if I could move on to you then as well. Um, you've, you've done some really interesting work yourself and Kieran, and, and how will that make a difference or, or you know, how, who, who will be using the results of your research uh, to achieve impact in the bioeconomy? Yeah. Yes, Maeve, indeed. And one of the aspects of the social network analysis is identifying intermediaries and important actors in the agricultural knowledge and innovation system that have established relationships with members of the agricultural population, particularly our target group, which is dry stock farmers. So we see um, actors such as Chagask advisors who have very close relationships and have great credibility in the eyes of uh, uh, our agricultural actors. We see a great potential there for diversifying the role of the range of services and information that are provided to farmers, which is always diversifying uh, in line with different policies and so on. But we would identify those actors and also community and rural development agencies um, as ha being very, uh, having the potential to be quite transformative in bringing the agricultural population into Ireland's bioeconomy. So we will certainly be targeting our initiatives at those actors, but also working with them in the co-design process. Great, thank you very much, Anya. Um, unfortunately, I think our, our time time is against us. I think we've co covered an awful lot of ground here. We've um, had insights into the research that Chagask is doing across three different program areas. Uh, we've covered land and marine, and we've covered a number of the kind of key principles in relation to the bioeconomy as well, such as biorefining, cascading, circularity. And I suppose we very much highlighted the potential of the bioeconomy to address a lot of the challenges facing conventional agriculture. Um, as we've also very much highlighted the need to think big, but I think also the very practical solutions that are there as well with the, with the PB bean example that we had from, from you. And so we, there is a lot of kind of systems thinking, there's a lot of value chain thinking, there's a lot of needing to link across disciplines and across a range of actors, but there are very simple solutions as well in a number of areas that, that can be brought forward. So it just behoves me to thank now our, our backroom team, in particular Sinead Fitzsimons, Livy McAuliffe and we're in Egan and uh, without whom we wouldn't have been able to put this um, event in place. Thank you to our three presenters, to Ewan Mullins, Brigitte Tewari and Anya Mack and Walsh. And thanks to all of you, the participants as well. Um, obviously, it's this, you know, there's no point in having these events unless we have, we have participants. And I'm conscious that there are a lot of activities uh, going on this week relating to the bioeconomy and encourage all of you to look at the Bioeconomy um, Ireland Week website, which you will see um, at the bottom of the slide here. There's events for everybody, um, researchers, um, industry, um, grannies, granddads, children, schools, and there's a lot of very, you know, um, uh, I suppose easy, easily accessible uh, material there for, for everybody. And I'd also like to highlight the Bioeconomy uh, Ireland Week map series that's uh, organised by Chagask. We started this last week, last year, whereby we produce one map every day to illustrate different aspects of the bioeconomy in Ireland to help to explain uh, what it is and why it's relevant to, to various people and the work that's been done. Um, so just encourage you again to have a look at that. And there's a lot of activity, obviously, in terms of social media uh, going on this week as well. So I encourage you to, to join in on that. And would like to thank uh, Biorbic and the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine for coordinating uh, Bioeconomy Ireland Week activities and look forward to the rest of the activities that are occurring during the rest of the week. Thank you very much, everybody, and hope you have a good day.